Hello everyone, this is the Ophthalmology Business Podcast, where we help you develop your ideal practice with help of other doctors and experts. The topics we cover include marketing, management, leadership, recruitment, HR, mindsets, and more. Every listener of this podcast is welcome to join the Ophthalmology Business Academy. The membership is on us, and it's our gift to you. Today, we have something special for you. We're going to share the R webinar featuring Dr. Anish Kapoor, where we discuss how technology and AI can help grow your ophthalmology practice. Plus, you'll also get to hear about the two biggest marketing mistakes made by practice owners in 2023, presented by Narain and Ryan Davies. Let's dive right in. So a little bit about Ryan Davis, who's our who's our moderator today. Ryan Davis is um, the director of marketing at Equa Marketing. Uh, he has a lot of experience with public speaking, uh, sales, marketing. His forte is you know the strategy side of marketing. So help practices figure out what the game plan is, what the strategy is to dominate, uh, especially ophthalmology practices, dominate Google, dominate SEO, as well as um, you know like. Once you're dominating Google and dominating SEO, why should your clients pick up the phone and call your office versus not call your office, right? Just because they see you again and again, organically doesn't mean you're going to get the phone to ring. So those are the two things he looks at. Um, he spent six hours researching client client online presence, online marketing. And then, of course, he has a conversation with practice owners and doctors about what he learned uh, his recommendations and so forth. So it's a really good benefit that we offer to, you know, um, our members. So Ryan, say a couple of words and let's introduce Dr. Anish right after that. For sure. Thanks, Narain. Yeah, no, I'm happy to be here. I love, uh, love these webinars and being able to uh, obviously, you know, sharpen my skills as well. But uh, really, that's exactly as Narain said, my, my goal is to ensure that uh, your practice has a good foundation for where you're at right now. Um, if you're, if you're in a great spot, how can we make it better? If you're not in a great spot, how, where, where do you start to, to put it in that great spot? Right. So we've got uh, a great presentation ahead of us today. That's going to talk a lot about exactly that. Are you, do you have all of the tools that are in place to be able to grow your practice and leverage, you know, what's out there today to give you that, that, uh, cutting edge to give you those hacks that, uh, maybe not everybody has in place. So you're, you're in a great place today and I'm really excited to, uh, to be a part of this presentation. Thanks, Narain. Thank you. Dr. Anish Kapoor, you know, most of you know who he is. He's an authority when it comes to AI. And of course, he's a practicing doctor. I'm, are you practicing at the moment, doctor? I know you're an ophthalmologist. No, no, no. no. You're so, not. no I'm, so I'm an internal medicine physician, uh, but I have a background in ophthalmology um, because I was the one of the founding members of iMedicWare, which was an ophthalmology specific EMR and practice management solution. Um, from there, we uh, were acquired by Eye Care Leaders, where we worked for uh, you know some time. And then after that, we left to form uh, Promptly, which is our new uh, new company. Right. So he's an entrepreneur, MD, and of course an innovator. So would love to hear what you have to say. I know you spend a lot of time on AI, which of course everyone is interested in. So right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like and, the, you know, it's... Yeah, it's the big buzzword now, right? Mm -hmm. So like. Today, what I want to focus on and, and, you know, is how to leverage AI at your practice and honestly, just within your life. Uh, I think that, you know, to start AI has gotten a lot of buzz and, and I think that it also gets sprinkled into conversations a lot more than it needs to um, because some simplistic things that you guys, you know, that people deal with every day use AI. Um, and there are some things that I think will just make even just deploying a project at your practice, deploying good methods and processes at your practice, um, using AI uh, you know, can make that really like, streamlined. And what I want to focus on today is not only things just you know, obviously within the ophthalmic space uh, that we do, but then outside of that, tools that we as a company use, tools that I know other companies and other practices are using, and you know, things that you can use AI to make your day better and make it work faster. So. I just kind of initially want to start on like, what is AI? Because I think the the problem with AI being used so much in the zeitgeist now is that it, it gets such a broad scope and gets kind of painted with uh, a, 
you know, brush that like anything that reacts to something is AI when like it's really not the case, right? Like, so for, you know, AI should be like when a computer system can do something that normally a human needs to do, right? So that's why you see things like uh, a captcha on the screen that a simple robot can't get past, right? Where like it asks you to recognize in this photo, which one, you know, has a crosswalk or a, uh, you know, a bicycle in it and things like that, right? Um, recognizing speech, uh, making decisions and translation between languages as well. So we're gonna talk about a couple of those today, uh, but there's simple things that you guys are using all the time, right? Like whenever somebody's on Netflix or YouTube, content recommendations based off what you're previous viewing, um, that's all artificial intelligence, trying to figure out what would be best for you next, right? Facial recognition to unlock your phones, spam filters where they're searching for certain pieces within um, your emails and so on. Search engines being able to you know, get you to the next, to the right place and chatbots, right? Chatbots are where we're seeing a lot of traction as well um, because they're interactive, right? But they're only as interactive as you can teach them. So you give them a lot of the different the prompts and you tell them how you can kind of walk through different pieces and then the chatbot can react to that. That's something that we're uh, uh, working on right now when it comes to scheduling and um, we're getting a lot of traction there on the development side to see like, okay, if I could teach the chat bot what the PM schedule looks like and what my criteria are, you know, what questions we ask a patient before we book them and things like that, then can the chat bot facilitate what a human would do on the phone, right? So there's layers of uh, artificial intelligence as well, right? So there's I think what I would consider the, these three stages here that I found from from mental stack, which was, you know, being able to imitate human, uh, you know, intellect behavior, and then from there, kind of building an algorithm so that it can be you know spread across a bunch of data and not only you know uh, one data set but metadata, right? So if we take you know not just your practices data, but now you know. You know, or not just one location's data, now multiple locations, now multiple entities, now multiple practices, right? Can we compile that to find what's best when it comes to best practices and things like that? Uh, and then deep learning, which is like kind of like the, the newest wave where AI has gone, where, you know, now all these networks start to connect together and they start to learn from each other, all right? And I think AI has evolved a lot and it's evolved a lot really quickly and it's continuing to do so and it gets both you know interesting and exciting but also a bit scary at the same time right so i do want to take just a minute or two to talk about how did we get here right so like there's a way that you know we went from a simple graphing calculator to skynet right like there's 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 an in-between and a path there right so these are just some highlights of like the past few years where, you know, in 2011, IBM's Watson, um, they are getting very, very involved in the healthcare space now. At the last HIMSS meeting, um, IBM Watson had a massive, massive presence and they are using the Watson capability to now crunch through data from multiple different healthcare systems to find best practices, trends, uh, ge geographic trends, uh, trends across race, age, ethnicity, ethnicity everything um, to try and better medicine, right? So, you know, back in 2011, it was impressive to have it be able to beat somebody at Jeopardy, right? Now we're trusting it to really go through all of our sensitive information and understand what we should be doing. Uh, even at some of the recent the trade shows and conferences like where IBM Watson, you know, at the American Academy of Dermatology, we uh, got to sample IBM Watson and they had a booth where a dermatologist can go in and try and recognize uh, images of different cancers and uh, different conditions versus at IBM Watson. And they were trying to see who was quicker and more accurate. And IBM Watson was, was beating them quite handedly, right? So, you know, those kind of things, especially when it comes to image uh, processing and things like that. I think a lot of that is going to start going away from humans. I think that humans will be, you know, the, the, the you know, we'll still have to check these things because again, you can't outrightly trust it, but I think first pass is going to um, go towards these kind of tools, especially IBM Watson uh, in the healthcare side. 
And, you know, it, it's a, it opens up a whole conversation of, well, does that also lower the skill set of people if they start trusting these things more and more, right? So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, talk there. The second, uh, then from there in 2014, so deep face recognition algorithms. Um, this is something that also, again, I think with everything that comes with AI comes a little bit of controversy as well. Um, deep face recognition algorithm can achieve uh, accuracy of facial recognition uh, at 97%. So, um, you know, we see that also with Google Photos and a few other pieces as well. Um, Microsoft, in 2016, launches their speech recognition that can transcribe human audio with few uh, with fewer mistakes than humans. Uh, they also have made one of the largest investments in ChatGPT, um, over a $10 billion investment, with ChatGPT and other aspects now being integrated into Bing search engine and um, Microsoft Office. Um, that's where I think that you're going to see a lot of that. And we're going to talk about that as uh, a little bit later in the presentation. 2017, Northwestern uh, University uh, develops an AI system that's able to beat 75% uh, of Americans in a visual uh, intelligence test. And then 2018, um, Alibaba AI uh, out of China is able to outscore uh, humans in the Stanford reading comprehension test. And it's only evolved from there, um, being able to you know, pass medical school exams, being able to pass legal exams, um, so, you know, even just these last few years, this gets outdated incredibly fast, right? And, you know, we could spend all day just, just talking about how this has evolved over time. But, you know, want to give you some background. And also, like, if you look at the subsection of years, you, you realize really quickly that it's a very short time frame how quickly that the technology evolves, right? So a little bit about um, myself, like uh, we talked about right from the get-go, I was a previous founder of a ophthalmology specific EMR and practice management system company, uh, now working in the patient engagement space with a company called Promptly. Uh, Promptly is a end-to-end -end patient engagement suite. And um, we also use a lot of, uh, you know, I would say that first and second stage of artificial intelligence. Um, we, we're not connected to neural networks or anything, but as an example of that, you know, we deal with all our patient intake, patient engagement, making sure that uh, things are on track for the front office. And where we see the most traction that, of things that we do is gonna be on the um, vision eligibility side. So a problem that especially ophthalmology has had for a long, long, long time is vision insurances. They are notoriously difficult um, just to deal with. They're difficult to understand and they're difficult just to get information, right? Hardly any of them interact with anybody. Um, or, or integrate with anybody. So you can't pull eligibility, authorization responses, things like that. So what we've developed is an artificial intelligence bot that actually will go and log into VSP, IMED, Davis, Victera, and others as somebody at your practice would. They will submit the information. And then once the you know, response comes back, they will read that response and then bring that information back to you within the property system. Now, there's a there's a fundamental piece like so there were systems that were doing this before but they were doing it uh, with something called screen scraping what a screen scrape does is it understands where things are on a screen and there's other companies that use this as well rectangle health and some other ones where they've achieved integration via screen scraping the problem that happens with screen scraping is that it's very reliant on nothing ever changing and moving. And some of these systems that that is the case, right? Where if you have a, um, a software that hasn't changed and hasn't evolved, a screen scrape is a simple, easy way to make integration happen without needing some sort of deeper uh, like API level integration or things like that, where the system knows, okay, on this screen, the you know box for name is here, the box for last name is here, and quite literally, you know, the mouse will go to that box, click, enter the information. Know where to go to the next box, click, and enter that information. The problem with screen scrapes is that when a system changes, so let's say that that last name field moves over a tiny bit, or let's say the screen doesn't perfectly align, you know, now this time when the, pay, when the uh, software maximizes the window, it doesn't line up exactly, the screen scrape breaks because the system just knows move my mouse here, click, enter the information. If it doesn't land on the right spot, 
it, it, and so it's it, it's rife for breaking, especially with updates. And the problem is a lot of these companies know that as well, right? So they know that people will find a way to build a script and work around these problems. So what an artificial intelligence can do that's different is actually read and understand the fields. Instead of saying, okay, this box is where I need to go and click, it reads first name and then understands that this is where I enter the first name. And then the next field, it reads the last name and understands that's where I enter the last name. So that's what makes it different and allows you to not worry about, okay, well, if later these, you know, VSP or IMED change the way that their system works, like, how is this going to work? Or like, are you going to need to do all new development and things like that? But you're not going to, because the best part about that is it's going to just understand where it needs to enter things in. So it's that understanding that I think is like the most impressive and, and important part of what we do when it comes to insurance eligibility. From there, I do want to talk about tools that we use at our company and some other companies that we work with, partners and, and things like that. Um, because I feel like a lot of times when I talk to practices, they get inundated with stuff about stuff that's for ophthalmology and ophthalmology only. And what I mean by that is, you know, so for example, like even like our software promptly, we're in the ophthalmology space. They go to these trade shows, they walk around, you see the booths at AAO, Asterisk, things like that, uh, the ASOA meetings. And it's people who are there to talk to practices within ophthalmology. But outside of that, it's a shame, but there's so many tools that can be used by a practice that can help them become more efficient outside of that normal scope of just stuff that integra integrates with their EMR and PM and clinical system and front office. One that we are really big fans of um, that we utilize every single day uh, across almost all of our teams is called Fireflies AI. And there's a few different ones. Um, another uh, really good one's called Otter. Um, but this one is one that uh, you know I wanted to talk to the team about because I had the most experience with it. But what it does is it is an AI system that will join your meetings. And they can be internal meetings. They can be you know a Google Meet, a Zoom, a Teams, Ring Central. It doesn't make a difference. But it listens to the meetings as an attendee. And then what it does is it will not only record the meeting for you, but it'll generate a transcript at the end. So it'll transcribe what, who says what, it'll transcribe tones. It'll let you know, like, yeah, even as an administrator, if you're looking at the meeting afterwards, like what percentage of uh, positive language was used, negative language was used, neutral language was used. It, what, how did people react at certain times? It'll uh, understand and, you know, judge that and, and, or, and show you that as well. And it, it'll capture, meeting notes. So it'll take notes for you. So it allows you to just have that conversation, be in the meeting, and then it'll also pull from those notes action items. So if I say, Ryan, uh, listen, after this, like, if you don't mind, if you could send an email out to just let everybody know that this webinar is, uh, you know, is taking place and they can get the recording in their portal, it'll just make that an action item. And then Ryan will see that. And they'll just bullet point that out. So we could have these conversations and it sounds like a small piece but for I want you guys to think about each meeting you have, right? So you have a meeting. Let's say that means half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, whatever it is. After that, are you wasting time putting notes together or like scribbling action items during it and trying to remember like where the, all those are or, you know, the, or even worse, did things fall through the cracks, right? Like, did we talk about this? Did we not? Um, can we make sure that we could check these off as a, as a list? Right. So we use these AI note takers to do that for us. And especially working with clients, um, it's even better. Right. So like we're getting on a call with a client or you get on a call with a vendor, with a partner, with a manufacturer. It doesn't make a difference. Right. Let this thing go in the background. Hey, here's what we talked about. Here's the items that came up. We have a record to go back to. Right. And we also know exactly what everybody said and um, who's. Uh, uh, who's got assigned what action items afterwards. So um, something to look into, something that I think is really beneficial. And, you know, the more that we work with practice administrators, which we, I, we've been doing for years and years and years now, like practice administrators are just incredible project managers on steroids, right? Like they are trying to launch not like one project because, you know, from 
uh, an outside company's point of view, you know, we're focused on our project, right? Like we want to get promptly up and running, or we want to get, you know, next gen or next tech or mod med or whatever up and running. Right. Um, but the practice administrator is dealing with that and their internal struggles and all the other things that like could possibly be happening at the practice that day. So trying to take these things off, off their plate is, is ideal, you know, um, whatever we can, whatever we can, uh, you know, uh, make fast. So the next one is called IORAD. IORAD is also incredibly um, uh, good for practices to standardize processes. One thing that we find all the time is that, you know, it's very difficult for a practice, you know, to standardize your processes because it becomes a little bit of a, uh, a game of telephone and B just kind of an overall tradition that's passed on and passed on. While a lot of documentation takes place, it's not usually like something that is constantly kept up with or somebody is fully doing that, right? Like as somebody who runs a software company, we have employees who, you know, at least one employee who's like full-time job is to work on documentation, update our documentation, make sure it's there, make sure that our team internally and our clients externally understand everything that's happening and it's all documented in there. I think at a practice level, we kind of don't, do that as much and focus on those pieces. And the, the shame of that is there's so many processes and procedures, right? Like one person at a front desk can have a different process and procedure than somebody who is in the same, at the same front desk, but their job is different, right? So even some of the tools that you use, that's where IORAD really can kind of kick in. And what I like about it is that it layers on top of whatever system you're doing. So what I do is I actually reach out to the IRAD team. This is something that we use, um, and it's actually something that we've overlaid on our software as well. But I had them quickly put together uh, uh, an IORAD of how to uh, how to access their Gmail inbox. So what that'll allow you to do is actually go through, and what you can do is actually have your uh, your team try it. So it tells, hey, click here to compose an e email. Select the text like this. So it makes you go through each step and learn how to do these things. And you can have these trigger based on when they're trying to do certain tasks, right? So it's actually having me click, right click and go to different features, right? So it's it's really good and, and allows you to really understand and, and solidify your processes there. This is a big one, Grammarly, Google Bard, ChatGPT. Supercharge your emails. The amount, you know, and I, I talked to an administrator the other day and they said, but basically my full-time job is responding to emails. That's what it comes down to, right? And it feels like that for a lot of us, right? Use the tools that are free and integrated into your email and integrated in uh, and can be layered on top. Grammarly is fantastic. Grammarly is a uh, Google Chrome extension and app that will fix your grammar. It will suggest, you know, how to reorganize sentences and uh, you know, really clean things up, makes it really easy. It also will work over your, you know, your, uh, your uh, Word documents and uh, Google documents, things like that. And really just all those little grammar things that you don't think of, of you know, where do I put the comma? You know, how should the, set, should the sentence be rearranged? It'll do that for you. And it uses um, uh, machine learning from looking at hundreds of thousands of different documents and emails and so on. And they'll even tell you, hey, you know, would you like to make this more formal? Would you like to make this a little, and, and it'll tell you the tone of your emails and stuff like that too. So you can like adjust that. Um, ChatGPT and Google Bard are fantastic as well. ChatGPT is on the Microsoft Microsoft Office side. Google Bard is on the Google side. Both uh, do the same thing. What's great about these is that you can actually tell it to write you something. So if you need to write letters or you need to, um, to put a note together or even like put some documentation together, you say, you know, Google Bard, I need a email that lets these people know that we are going to be closed on the 25th because of XYZ and it'll just put together a whole formal email for you and you can send that out. So if it's not integrated into your email itself, you can always use that as a separate tool, copy and paste it, bring it on over. And that you know, honestly cuts down a massive amount of time. Really quickly um, on the translation side, this is something that's really, really exciting. This is called HeyGen. Um, this is a software system that is for um, translation. But what's very cool about it is not only does it do full translation, but it also changes the way that the, uh, somebody looks if you record a video. So for people who are doing marketing, and for people who are um, you know, trying to you know, advertise to different demographics and different uh, 
uh, languages, it's very, very cool. So if you see that what he does is he starts, and again, this person does not speak any other language. around the world. Well, well, no, with AI, let me show you how. And Mundo. I guess so we get to Spanish. Ahora puedes hacerlo con IA. Déjame mostrarte cómo. सोचिए अगर आप आठ भाषाओं में बात कर सकते हो और दुनिया भर के अधिकांश लोगों से जुड़ सकते हो कि स्टूच ने इंटेलिजेंसी पोजबुल रची पोका जयाक लेसे मुआ वो मोंट्रे कमां सो इफ यू सी नॉट ओनली इज इट ट्रांसलेटिंग द साउंड बट एट द सेम टाइम इट्स ट्रांस चेंज द वे दैट हिज लिप्स वर्क सो दैट यू डोंट गेट द डबिंग इफेक्ट इन व्हिच यू नो इट लुक्स लाइक इट्स यू नो डब्ड आफ्टरवर्ड्स राइट So, um, I think one of the last ones that we're going to talk about is yeah, the last one we're talking about is going to be project management software. So we use a lot, utilize a, this a lot on our side, and I feel like a lot of practices when they are tracking their projects and the things that they are trying to execute within their uh, practices, they're doing it kind of manually. They're doing it through just emails and spreadsheets and things like that, um, where a project management system is something that is I think essential. When you're you know, uh, you're running any team that's trying to like complete a lot of different tasks, when you're either doing conversions to things or implementing new projects and processes and things like that, um, there's some great ones. We utilize uh, Motion and we utilize ClickUp as well. Um, again, that we are somebody who's deploying software, so it's a little bit different. But on your guys' side, I I think that something simple like Motion is fantastic because it actually will help you keep a schedule, right? The one thing that I think administrators don't have any extra of is time, and it's very difficult. So if you put in to Motion, like say, hey, listen, this is what I need to get done. These are the steps and tasks I need to do to get it done, and it'll integrate into whatever calendar system you guys are using and help you build out your schedule, and it kind of works from there. So you know, I would look into Motion. I would look into ClickUp. Um, as another good one, and Asana is another good one as well, um, just to help you launch and understand and keep organized when it comes to running uh, projects within your practice. So um, I know I might be a little over time, and I apologize for that. So if you need anything, again, my email is anish.kapoor at focalpointholdings.com, and um, you, you can always contact us through promptlycheckin.com or focalpointholdings.com as well. Thank you so much, Anish. I appreciate uh, the presentation. I think it's a you know AI is on everyone's mind, so I really appreciate you taking the time to share your experience. Speaking of AI, it's kind of interesting. Um, I studied computer science, uh, I guess, in 1994. Of course, uh, we were introduced to neural networks back then as part of our undergrad courses, but in those days, we couldn't imagine the kind of compute power we have today. It's just uh, like millions of times more power today than 25 years ago. So of course, even though theoretically it makes ton of sense, uh, uh, nobody uh, had the computing to pursue it. Uh, the the data, we don't have the data. We don't have the compute. Uh, you know, we don't have the memory. We don't have any of that. So, anyways, so uh, Jeffrey Hinton is considered to be the father of neural networks. Uh, he happens to be a professor at University of Toronto, and I live like 20 minutes from where he uh, teaches. And he kind of, you know, started the whole thing. I mean, this whole um, uh, large language models, as they are known. Uh, many of his students, I guess, now run companies like, uh, you know, OpenAI, which uh, is owns ChatGPT. And um, Google was, I guess, the leader in this whole space for a long time. They had no competition. And then I guess the story is, at least as Elon Musk says it, um, you know, to combat uh, uh, Google, they started OpenAI as a nonprofit, of course, then it became a for-profit and now it's a for-profit, but some social mission tied to it. Uh, now it's, um, I guess, a, is a race uh, where all the trillion dollar companies want to see who can take over the world using AI. So anyways, it's a fun time to be. Uh, my daughter is studying computer science, I guess now. So I guess it's kind of interesting. So some of the courses she's taking are like, you know, machine learning and, you know, uh, both the, 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 the engineering side as well as some of the, you know, theoretical side. So it's, it's fascinating. Uh, I guess uh, strap on, the world is going to change quite a bit over the next 25 years. Uh, how it's going to change? Um, I think we'll all have um, self-driving cars already. You know, the Tesla does that. You know, it can take you door to door. Uh, for the most part, it, it's still like a 15-year-old driving the car as opposed to a 25-year-old, I mean, a 30-year-old adult driving the car. It's, you know, sh you know, a bit 
not smooth and so forth, but still it's pretty smart for a computer to do what it does. Uh, so we will have self-driving cars. Uh, you know, we probably won't even own cars. You know, it'll be a service. So lots of things are going to change. So I think we just have to embrace it and make the most of it. Like uh, Dr. Kapoor said, I think starting with simple stuff like emails, meetings, I think are, are a great place to start. So let me jump right in. Two biggest marketing mistakes uh, ophthalmology practices practice owners make in 2023. So I'm just going to really, you know, uh, focus on marketing and, um, you know, really give you something actionable you can act on. Because I know when I survey doctors, the challenges they keep telling me is referrals are, you know, becoming less and less and less and less and competition is increasing. Uh, costs are going up. So how do you um, overcome that? One of the ways to overcome that is to, you know, think of marketing as a strategic advantage. Think of marketing as something that uh, gives you an edge in in your community, in your in your market, and also think of marketing as a way to grow your profitable part of your practice. So, if there are certain parts of your practice that make you more money than others, then of course that's a great way to think of marketing. So, um, I have eighteen years of experience in marketing. My first ophthalmology client, I think I started working with him like you know sixteen, seventeen years ago, or maybe eighteen years ago, but um, he's still with us and. Uh, and uh, we run, we do the whole marketing and our focus is to help him dominate SEO, dominate Google. And through that, drive a lot of new patients every single month. Of course, uh, dominating Google is one part. The other part is, you know, how do we convince people to pick up the phone and call the office? Uh, how do we do that online? How do we do that on a smartphone? How do we do that on, on a desktop? Um, so the whole, you know, start to finish from, somebody who has never heard of you keep seeing you all the time because you dominate SEO to the phone ringing. So that's kind of what we focus on. Uh, we started the ophthalmology business podcast with quite a few uh, clinicians like fellow, you know, ophthalmologists plus, um, you know, others in the ophthalmology field. So practice administrators and so forth. So we are, we have, we have celebrated our 50th uh, show recently. So we'll put a link to it. So if you are not subscribed to it, subscribe to it. You can listen to it on iTunes, Google Play. It's a great way to, you know, uh, keep yeah. keep on top of what's going on. That's a little bit about me and what you're going to learn today. So the two mistakes I'm going to focus on, the first one is what I call the ophthalmology buyer's journey. Like, are you mastering it? Like, how do people buy today versus 1998, 25 years ago? And have you mastered your marketing to line up with how people buy today because you might have great marketing but if it's not aligned with how people go about making a decision to choose you then of course you won't win so it doesn't matter how good your marketing is you will lose so really teaching you the buyer's journey and helping you optimize for that second is google seo is one-fifth the cost of google ads and one-tenth the cost of google uh, social media ads so it's a lot 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 less expensive but the tricky thing is only 5% of you can do well with SEO. Why? Because Google makes $224 billion from ads. So it makes SEO really hard. So if you don't understand this, you don't have that 10x advantage. Like if somebody else is spending 10,000, you can get the same outcomes for $1,000. So because you don't have this advantage, now you're wasting that extra 9,000 every month to get new patients when you don't need to. So it's really like, understanding the most effective way to get new patients and knowing what the secrets are so you can focus on it and get those results. So to, to me, these are the two big mistakes that separates the most successful marketers who spend the least amount of money. So it's both, right? Not only being good at marketing, but also spending the least amount of money. So what's the mistake number one? Not mastering the ophthalmology buyer's journey. When you don't master the ophthalmology buyer's journey, you don't, um, it's like, you're playing, uh, I don't know, a, a game, but the rules that you know are for a different game. You're going to lose, right? You're playing you know, one game where there's a certain set of rules, but you think it's some other game and you're playing the other game and you're going to lose. So not understanding the buyer's journey in 2023 means you might be doing marketing that you think is good, but it's not working. It's not giving you the results. So don't let the lack of understanding of the ophthalmology buyer's journey hold you back. So that's, uh, you know, that's the key, right? So, um, the evolution of ophthalmology buyer's journey. So how people bought in 1993, the reason I wanted to kind of use this example is 
just to kind of um, show the difference of how the world has changed. So back then, 1993, some of us who are old enough can remember, we had this thing called Yellow Pages. In those days, you needed anything, whether it's a car shop to fix your car that got into an accident, or whether it's uh, you know, a dentist or whether it's uh, ophthalmologist, you typically would go to the yellow pages, unless of course you are referred by an existing doctor. Outside of that, you would typically go to a yellow pages, you will look for what you need. And typically there'll be ads at the top of the section, at the, at the start of the section. So let's say there's a section for, uh, you know, um, you know, ophthalmology, there'll be ads. So the biggest practices that are doing the biggest surgeries, the LASIK and so forth, will run big ads, half page ads, full page ads. Usually you look at them first and they will have information on what they do and how they do it. If they can do their, do your job, then you'll call them. If they cannot, you will keep going, keep going, keep going till you find somebody. That's how it, things worked back in 1993. So it was all, uh, you know, the ad companies had all the power. Consumers had no power. So they had to kind of call the person who had the biggest ad because that's the only way to find an ophthalmologist or find anything for the, for that matter in those days through the yellow pages. Today, things are totally different. Now we go to Google and we start researching. Instead of looking up the yellow pages, most of us may have looked, the, looked at the yellow pages maybe once a month, twice a month, because we need something new. Today, we look at Google 10 times a day, 20 times a day, because Google has become this, you know, find anything I want resource. Also answer any question I want any have resource. So whether I'm looking to get answers to questions or whether I'm, you know, finding any resource I'm, I want, I go to Google. So people are using Google to both Google to both educate themselves. So let's say they heard about, you know, um, you know, a particular procedure, like let's say, um, you know, cataract, right? And they, they starting to think they have cataract, they're not sure. So they're looking up what it is, what it means, how it works. And also in the process, they're trying to find a doctor who can help them with the cataract surgery. So they're educating themselves and finding a solution, both happening at the same time. Sometimes it's a single search, but most times it's multiple searches over multiple days and weeks and months. And eventually they pull the trigger, they call somebody, they go make an appointment to see that doctor, that talks, doctor takes care of them. So the world has totally changed. So notice a few things, right? Now I can type in anything I want. Yellow Pages doesn't have anything I want. There's only certain sections because it's limited, right? It has only certain so, so many pages. So here I could type in a specific type of, you know, service like, you know, cataract or like LASIK surgery, right? As opposed to just looking for an ophthalmologist. Now in the, like Yellow Pages did not have a cataract section and a LASIK section and so forth. So what that did, the reverse of that is what we are, we are in the world of long tail. So even with an ophthalmology, it's no longer good enough to just rank for the word ophthalmology, ophthalmologist. You have to go after all these different things you do, all the different surgeries, all the different services you offer. So there might be 40 different or 30 different buckets that you want to dominate for. So that's good, right? Because now you can dominate each one of those 30 or 20 of those 30, and you don't need to have a big budget. In those days, even in 1993, to get a half page ad, you're looking at two, three thousand dollars. That's five, six thousand dollars. Just that's in this in a in a mid-sized town, mid-sized city. So in big cities, it could be in the tens of thousands. So in today's dollars, that's so prohibitive. So usually, what that meant is the big got bigger, the large ones got larger, and the small ones didn't have a chance. Now, because people are typing in these different searches, and you under, if you understand SEO, you don't have to suffer. You know, like in the old days. So let's understand the ophthalmology bias journey. So 90% start by searching on Google. They discover a doctor either through an ad or through organic. The advantage of organic is you can show up multiple times. So whatever they're typing in, you keep showing up, keep showing up, keep showing up. So they keep seeing you again and again through organic. That's the ideal, right? If they don't see you through organic and they come through ads. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then they go to the website. And once they go to the website, if they come through organic or SEO, they'll give you 90 seconds. If they come through ads, they'll give you 15 seconds. So that's the key. Um, so if they're giving you 90 seconds, in the 90 seconds, the question they're asking is, are you an expert? Hey, I'm looking for somebody who can help me with cataract or LASIK. Are you an expert? Have you done these cases before? What do patients have to say? They don't care that you are an expert ophthalmologist. They just care that expert in the thing they just Googled. And then do they, do I trust you? Like, you know, 
everybody has qualifications, everybody has a relevant degrees, but what do patients have to say? So those Google reviews are really important. And finally, do I like you? You know, they're kind of afraid of going to the doctor, especially, you know, specialists like ophthalmologists, because sometimes they think the, these people don't have any time and they know so much and we don't want to look stupid. So they are intimidated by doctors. So are you down to earth? Are you easy to talk to? So having simple videos that explain things in simple language on those pages, like LASIK page or, you know, different, different pages on your website will help them like you. So these are the three things you need to pay attention to. So step one is dominate Google, right? Or buy ads, we can do both on Google. Step two is once they go to the site, if they come through ads, know that they'll give you 15 seconds. And if they come through SEO, know that they'll give you 90 seconds. And we hope you have the 90 seconds because let's assume you're dominating Google. Then are you convincing them of these three things? Are you an expert? Do I trust you? Do I like you? Question number one, are you an expert? Why is this question important to the patient? Because we live in a world of specialization. You know, I think of sushi. Again, going back to 1998, there was Benihana's. So uh, there was only one type of sushi restaurant. Today, there are different types of Japanese restaurants, sushi, soup, and even within sushi, there is the, you know, designer sushi, flame sushi, South American sushi, you know, vegan sushi. I mean, like you name it, you, you know, uh, made by a world famous chef sushi, you know, uh, buffet sushi, you name it. There's all kinds, all varieties. So today what people are looking for is I'm looking for a specific kind of sushi. I'm looking for designer sushi. Oh, I'm looking for somebody who's really good at cataract. And when they are looking for that, they want to make sure you are really good at that particular thing. You're really good at cataract surgeries. So that's key. So you have to sh explain to them or not explain to them with your own words, but through proof, you have to explain to them you're good at it. So perhaps, you know, depending if you're doing aesthetics, you could have before and after pictures. If you're doing medical, have testimonials, ideally video testimonials or audio testimonials where people share their experience about that particular procedure and then highlight it on your page. So they go there, they see these, you know, testimonials that are very specific to the particular thing they are interested in. They're like, wow, he's impressive, right? So that's why this question is important. And, and the way to do that is to go after testimonials uh, if it's medical and, and to go after before and after if it is aesthetics. So that's how you establish you're an expert. Again, don't stop with one, go for two, go for three, go for four. Again, don't stop with one page, you know, like LASIK, do every page, every service you want to dominate for. Question number two, do I trust you? Why is trust important? Because, you know, this is health, right? Like health for most people, if you ask them, is the most important thing, right? You know, because that's one thing that none of us want to use. None of us want to use our eyes, lose our eyesight. None of us want to, you know, have health issues, right? Like especially uh, once you pass 30, 40 years, this becomes by far the most important thing in your life. So trust is important. They want to make sure that they're going to somebody who has a good track record. So Google reviews, like how many stars do you have? How many reviews you have are really important. Take those reviews and put them in the relevant pages. So when I go to your you know, page for LASIK, for example, I should see those reviews. I should be able to click on it and see all your reviews. I should be able to see how many stars you have. I should be able to see how many reviews you have. Make it easy for me to trust you like in seconds. Remember, they're giving you 90 seconds. If they have to now go and search somewhere else and find how many reviews you have, they don't have the patience. They will move on as opposed to you just spoon feed it to them. You show all the Google reviews, make the Google page a link away. They're going to trust you more. Question number three, do I like you? Why is liking important to the patient? Liking is important because like I said, because healthcare is very personal and, and because it's, you know, uh, they, they want to make sure they, they like the people, they like the doctors, like the team. So these types of videos that I alluded to, I think are a good way to get people to like you. Why is liking important? Without liking, they're not calling your office. If they don't call your office, you don't book that appointment. So it creates a chain reaction, a negative chain reaction that will have a direct impact on your new patients. So summarize today, 90% of patients use Google to find and choose an ophthalmology practice habit. Google search is used 8.5 billion times a day to find answers to every question. Like I said, Google was the first company of all the big companies to invest heavily into AI. So everything they do is AI driven and has been all the algorithms are AI driven. Uh, I mean, they, they dominate, right? Like we use Google more than we use any other product in the world. 
every single day. Mistake number two, SEO is a winner to take all game, not knowing how to win. SEO is a winner to take all game, not knowing how to win. This is the second and the biggest mistake practices make. So why do I say that it's a winner to take all game? Um, in 2018, somebody studied 920 million web pages and they found out that zero, 91% of them, 90.88% of them literally get zero traffic for free from Google. Zero traffic, zero people go to 90, 91% of the web pages. That's 829 million web pages out of the 900 million web pages get zero traffic. So 5% of the web pages get 95% of the traffic. 5% of the web pages get 95% of the traffic. So the goal is to be in the top 5%. And most practice owners don't know how to do that. They don't know how to get into the top 5% that get 95% of the uh, traffic. So that's the second part of my presentation today. Now, why did Google make it so hard where only 5% get 95% of the traffic? Economics. Google makes $224 billion or made $224 billion in 2022 just from Google ads. So if I'm Google, I need to keep making more money, which means the people are getting free traffic. I need to make that pool smaller and smaller and smaller. So 5% and that number continues to drop are the ones getting all the free traffic. So the other 95% turn around and give Google $224 billion. So Google loves the 95% who give them $224 billion, but they need the 5% because without the 5%, nobody will use Google, right? We don't go to Google to look for ads. We go to Google to see the organic results. So that's that's the key here. Now, how do you help? Uh, how do you how do you help Google see you as a top five percent website and dominate a CEO? Number one, I'll get into each one. Nav consistency. Number two, high Google Lighthouse score. Number three, Google Eat. Number four, original content. Number five, quality backlinks. And last but not least. Uh, which I didn't add on the slide is number of Google reviews you have. It's not as important as the other five, but it is still important. So you still also want to pay attention to Google reviews. So if you get an A in each one of them, you get into the top 5%. I'll use an analogy. You want to get into the top medical school, right? You have to ace your uh, you know, MCAT. You have to ace your GPA in your undergrad you have to get great recommendations. You have to have done a great interview. Pretty much you are A, 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 A in everything they're looking at. If you ace everything, then you have a decent chance or some chance of getting into the top school. Same thing. If you ace these five plus Google reviews, then you have a, a chance of getting into the top 5%. But the advantage of getting into the top 5%, just like the advantage of getting into the top school or program is significant. It'll last you for a lifetime. The other catch here is because Google is free every day, as opposed to the top medical schools are not, you have to keep fighting for it every day. You have to like, just because you did well yesterday, doesn't mean you're going to be in the top 5% today. You have to fight again today because Google changes its rules every, every 10 times a day to keep you on your toes. Why? Because they want more of you to spend money on ads. So they do everything they can to make this difficult. So not only do you need to get into the top 5%, but you have to work hard in maintaining those A scores in all these six areas. So you stay in the top 5%. That's the secret. That's the summary, but I'll get into the details now. So NAP, NAP stands for name, address, phone number, consistency, name, address, phone number, consistency. So you want to make sure you have consistent name, consistent address, and consistent phone number. So I'll use this example, Orange County Eye Institute, right? It's four words, Orange, one word, County, one word, I, one word, Institute, one word. It doesn't matter whether it's four words or, you know, Orange County is one word and I Institute, another word, doesn't matter how you write it. But the key is you have to write it consistently. So however you do it, do it consistently. And uh, same thing with address, right? 24422, Avenida, Tilaca, Calota, number 110, Laguna Hills, California. So, you know, he could have put sweet 110. He did not, right? He could have put, you know, uh, sweet number 110. He did not. He put a number sign. So however you write your address, be make it consistent, right? Same thing with the phone number, make it consistent. So what happens is when we start looking at this for our clients, um, like Ryan has seen many, many of these sites, 90% of the time, there are issues between just your website and your Google My Page. Now, you have to go and clean up these issues, not just on those two sites, your website and your Google My Page, but hundreds of sites. So there are directories. There's all kinds of sites online with your 
business name, address, and phone number. So you need an army to go and find those issues, clean them up. So we have an army. That's what we do for Orange County Eye Institute. Over time, that army just keeps cleaning more and more. And currently he has more than a hundred sites, which are all sending him phone calls and traffic and helping with SEO with consistent name, address, and phone number. So it's a combination of tech and people. Tech will find the problems, people will solve it. You can do it, but you won't have a dedicated person whose job it is this, so usually it'll get ignored. That's typically what happens with most ophthalmology practices. Now, if you have multiple doctors, the problem becomes even more interesting because now you have to take care of NAP not only for the practice name, but also for the doctor's name. So if you have six doctors, now you have to do it six times. So this can become a huge project, but a really, really, really important project. Google Lighthouse Code. Do you want to take this, Brian? Sure. Yeah. I mean, Google Lighthouse, this is, I, I always like to call it like the IRS for the internet, right? So they're running a live audit and it's on every page on your site. So as Narain was saying, you know, you have your homepage, your about us page, about cataracts, about different, all of your procedures, every single one of these, Google runs its own lighthouse score on it. And basically it looks at over 60 factors, everything from, are your photos in the right size, the right format, are they the you know the newest format? Uh, do you have unused JavaScript? Are things fully accessible? So under the American Disabilities Act, um, you know, are do you have your site accessible to anybody of any ability or disability? Closed caption for videos, proper contrast ratio for color blindness, screen readers for for total blindness, etc. Ophthalmology, obviously, this is something very important. Not everybody can see everything clearly, right? So we got to make sure fully accessible. Best practices, is it safe and secure? Are you doing what, what most sites are doing from that standpoint? Do you have a progressive web app and SEO? So do you have the proper headings and titles and meta tags and everything else, right? So these change over time. It's a constantly changing thing. This is something that we monitor to make sure that this is up to date. If you don't have this up to date, you know, um, you are going to get rank lower. A passing score on this, again, everybody here, you know, doctors, we've got this idea of, of perfection. So does Google. 90 plus is a pass. That's what they want to see. That's your A score. 89 to 50 is we'll let it go, but it's not one of those elite scores that we want to rank higher. 49 and lower is a fail. And you have to make sure that you have this for both mobile and desktop for every page on your site. So this is a heavy undertaking and something critically important for your Google rankings. Absolutely. Google Eat, uh, another one. It doesn't affect every industry, but it affects uh, healthcare. So E stands for expertise, A for authority, and T for trust. Remember, healthcare information has consequences. So you, somebody reads something online, they think it's correct, they do it, follow it, something bad happens. Somebody's going to get sued, right? So Google doesn't want to get sued or doesn't want an article saying somebody died because they read an article on Google, right? So the way Google tries to avoid it is just tries to make sure that the information it's ranking for are associated with people who have these three, uh, three qualities. One is expertise. So in simple terms, if you have an MD from a reputed university, include that in a bio on every single page. Again, you have to do it a certain way for Google to like you. Remember, Google is not trying to help everyone they want to help only less than 5%. So they'll make it hard. You have to follow their rules. So that's something we do. Authority, just because you have an MD still not enough. In Google's eyes, some are better than others. So if you are given lectures and those lectures are on video format and we can highlight those lectures on the relevant pages, they think you're an authority in a particular topic because you have given that lecture on that topic. Or even if it's a video where you have explained something about that topic and we put that video um, link to some other website, then they think you are an authority. Last trustworthiness, I already alluded to Google reviews. I talked about it from the point of view of getting people to um, you know, choose you, right? But also Google won't choose you if they don't see those reviews. So if Google has to rank two people, one person has reviews showing up on that page, and the person doesn't, the one who has reviews showing up, the trustworthy one will be ranked. So that's Google Eat. So the webmaster team does two things. They work on Google Lighthouse code day in and day out because those algorithms are changing weekly. And then they also work on Google Eat so that those things get incorporated with Google's changing standards. Remember AA in Google Eat, Google Lighthouse, and NAV so far. Original content, why don't you take this? For sure, yeah. And I mean, 
this is an extreme standard here from Google's perspective in that uh, no more than 5% of the words on a website can be duplicate. So first of all, for it to properly index, you need at least 400 words, right? So we can't just have like, hey, here's a page and here's one word and it's good enough and Google will know what we're talking about here. That means I'm an expert, right? We're talking about expertise, authority, trustworthiness. It takes time to explain that. Google recognizes that. But that means that only 20 of those 400 words can be repeated. Google wants to see that you provide original, unique content. When they send somebody there, they pre-vetted your site. That's why you rank at the top, that you can answer questions and that you answer them in a unique way and you have expertise in this. They don't want to know that you can go control C and control V and copy and paste somebody else's information to your site and become, uh, become an expert in that or pose as an expert in that, right? So you want to make sure that you have original content that are provided to your site that is being constantly updated because again, people can take that content and hijack it for their site too. So it's constantly making sure that you have original, unique content that speaks in your voice and your brand to your demographic um, to showcase that expertise, authority, and trustworthiness. Um, we have teams uh, that are spending hundreds of hours each month doing research and thought, putting into original content, not pulling again, chat GPT, fantastic for those emails and things that we talked about earlier. For content to your site, what chat GPT does is it pulls from a reservoir of other information and puts it up onto into that, right? So that information already exists. That's how chat GPT works. It takes expertise that's been recognized and pulls it. It's why this original content is so difficult to stay ahead of. And that needs to be so important on your site that you are creating something that is unique and that people see value in and Google sees value in from that perspective. Yeah. So if you get an F in any one of those, not, not forget about an F, a B in any one of those, you're not going to be the top 5%. You're not going to get 95% of the free traffic. So we just like stopping all of this. So the way we thought about it is like, let's have a team that takes care of all of this. So let me recap. Patients start with a Google search. They uh, find your website at the top of Google. They visit your SEO optimized website. They find you as an expert. They like you. They trust you. Your phone rings. That's it. So there's a machine that can make all of this happen. That's kind of what marketing is. Um, I mean, good marketing is. And the most cost-effective marketing is. So how do you answer your phone? That's a totally separate topic. We can cover that on a sub separate day. Um, and uh, let's... Um, so you met Ryan. He knows more about what I just talked about more than me. He's an expert. He has helped dozens and dozens of practices with what we call a marketing strategy meeting. It's our gift to you. We'll put a link. So the marketing strategy meeting is a six hour review by Ryan and his team to find out how well you are doing with regards to Google and also how the phone is, uh, how your landing pages are doing. Meaning once you start ranking, are those pages going to make the phone ring or not ring? So during the meeting, the 90, the 90 minute meeting, Ryan would give you a, a, a plan to get into the top 5%, meaning rank for hundred or more keywords regardless of where you are, and then also help you um, convert those people from your landing pages. So he'll point out things you should do to convert those people. So he'll give you a plan to get into the top 5% and make the phone ring. And also he'll tell you what's wrong. So you'll say, okay, you're nap, here are the issues. I only found four, but there's many, many more like this. So we need to go and find them and fix them. Original content, here are the issues. I only found these, but we need to make sure they don't happen and, and we fix them. And also we don't never do it again. So he'll just give you a report card and a plan. So you can take the report card and the plan and you know, do whatever you want with it. So it's our gift to you. Uh, uh, no, no, uh, no catch, uh, no, 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 nothing. Um, so if you don't want to work with us, no big deal. But if you do decide to work with us, I'll share our fee structure real quick. It's 1250 a month, um, all inclusive. In the first two months, we put extra hours. So typically, we're supposed to put 30 hours or more. In the first two months, we end up putting 200 hours. Why do we put 200 hours? To make Google happy, to build a custom design website. Um, so that's the whole thing. So we, we we don't charge for the extra 140 hours. It's on us. And then, um, and then once the website's alive, we do all the six things that we talked about. So we have a team of 200 people, 14 sub-teams inside those people, a team of 200. They just do their piece, whether it's a CEO, whether it's influence, they do their piece. And then they report to their managers. You get monthly reports. And by the end of the year, you should rank for 100 keywords. You should be getting 100 phone calls, typically 20% of new patient calls just from Google SEO. The other thing I want to mention about Ryan is like 89% of the people who have done the meeting said it's like the best marketing meeting they ever had. So, hey, I think this would be a really good use of your time. So 
take advantage of this, uh, you know, this particular thing. So we do have some questions. How do I know if I'm in the top 5%? So I too get 95% of the free traffic. Do you want to take this, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, selfishly, I mean, this is exactly what, what I do, right? Is This is the best way of doing it. Is you, you could sit there and you could Google search yourself over and over again and, and geofence and put yourself in VPN, other areas to understand all of the keyword search terms that you think people are looking for or take advantage of the marketing strategy meeting where this is exactly what I do is, is pull this out for you. But basically the way that you're going to be able to organically tell is, you know, what, what percentage of your patients are coming from Google? Are you tracking that? Can you see that? Are you asking that question? And if it is not, you know, a considerable number of, you know, a hundred phone calls plus a month, 20 plus new patients a month, if you've been doing it for a while, um, you know, that you're, you're not there. Right. So you, you can do it and you can spend the time doing it. You can take advantage of me. I can spend the time doing it for you. We can discuss this uh, from that perspective, but that's really what it comes down to is the importance of that marketing strategy meeting is understanding where are you today and how are you going to get to where you want to get to? You need that foundation, that understanding of where are you right now? And that's, that's the best way to do it. In my opinion. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll take the next one. Why do 95% of ophthalmology practices not rank on Google and get almost no traffic? I think there was a slide where I talked about how much money Google makes from Google ads. That's why. I mean, they want the 95% who don't get any traffic to give them Google ad money, which is how they make so much money. Ophthalmologists alone spend hundreds of millions, if not billion plus on Google ads. So that's the reason why they make it so hard. So only 5% get all the benefit and 95% get none of the free benefit. I'm currently spending on a lot on Google ads. Is that a good strategy? Typically, if you're spending on Google ads, your budget will be five to 10 times more than a CEO budget. So our cost is 1250. So you will be spending 7,000 to 15,000 on Google ads to get similar results to compare apples and apples. Now, the advantage of Google ads is it's immediate. So you want to get patients 10 minutes from now or two days from now, you can do it. But with SEO, it'll take a bit of time. So that's the advantage. But the downside of Google ads is it, it is five to 10 times more expensive for the same outcomes. So why do you want to keep spending, you know, an extra 100,000, 150,000 every year instead of just spending 12, you know, 15,000 a year to get the same outcomes. So that's that's the simple answer. So I say dominate Google. And then once you're dominating a CEO, then use ads to top up, meaning there are certain keywords or certain cities you're not ranking for just yet. So in the meantime, use ads. That's what my clients do. Once they realize that Google ads are so much more expensive, they don't want to waste their ad money. They are very strategic with their ad money. What can an Equa client expect within 12 months? You will rank for 100 or more keywords on page one, which means top 10 results on SEO, and you will get 100 calls, typically 20% of new patient calls. Now we are starting to incorporate call reviews. So every three months we'll tell you how you're doing answering your phone calls. So once you get 100 calls, we will review them and tell you, okay, here are the calls you're booking, here are the calls you're not. And that's important, right? What if your marketing is working, but your patients are not getting booked into appointments? You want to know that. So that way we can, you know, sort those out. Those are the questions. Anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Nothing from my end. I, I appreciate the time today. I think this was great. I hope people take advantage of that uh, strategy meeting. I think it's incredibly important to be able to, again, learn where you are today to figure out where you want to go, whether you use it with us or you use it with whatever you want to put it into motion. Um, they're incredibly valuable and uh, take advantage of my time, please. That, that's the way to do it for sure. So thanks, Noreen. I appreciate, uh, appreciate you having me here today for sure. Absolutely. And also thank you, Dr. Anish, for your time today as well. I also want to take a minute to thank our listeners. We appreciate each and every one of you. We cannot do what we do without you. If you like the podcast, share it on pod, on, on social media, share it with your friends. You know, even write a review for us on Google or iTunes. Your reviews will help other doctors and practice owners find us. Till we meet again, wishing all of you an amazing week ahead. <laughs>